Good evening, everybody. It's uh, just past 7.30, and uh, I think we will begin. Uh, introduce myself first. I'm, my name is Les Miller, and I'm going to be guiding you through a series of reflections uh, about how we deal with the darkness in our time. And um, one of the uh, issues that we th that we have is uh, the um, not only the the pandemic, but the the tension, the political tensions, the uh, all that we've gone through in, in in the past year or so, and underlying all of that, we have the ecological crisis as well. But how do we f form a path forward during these trying times? Our uh, can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yes. Great, great. So um, I am going, you're not gonna to see too much of me tonight. Um, save your monitors that way, I think. But what uh, we will do, I'll be uh, using um, a slide. So I'm going to start to share my screen. Um, the other thing I should tell you is a bit about my background for those that don't know me. Um, I've been an, uh, an educator, uh, a, a lifelong educator, but I've also been part of Our Lady Queen of the World Parish uh, for uh, about seven, eight years doing some ministry that way. Before that, I taught York Catholic um, and University of Toronto. And um, as I was saying, I'm teaching a catechetical formation program with the Archdiocese of Toronto and the University of Dayton. Um, I'm also a writer and uh, most of my books have, are published by Novalis. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God of light and of love, guide our ways during these dark times. Bring healing to the sick, comfort to the grieving, and hope to the despairing. Bless the path that we walk together over these five weeks. Grant us wisdom to rest in the light of your grace. Give us courage to walk in hope and overcome the temptations of fear. That our lives reflect your divine light. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to be using my background as an educator and a writer to reflect on our situation right now. And the paths that we could follow that uh, lead us out of this dark night that we're sharing. The big idea that will organize these reflections is this. In the midst of our darkness, it's particularly important to focus on Christ. Christ is the light of the world and the path that will guide us out of the darkness by contemplating the, ri the rays of Christ's light. We can nurture hope in ourselves and in our families by doing this. I'd like to thank Father Jojo and the Our Lady Queen of the World Parish community for hosting this series. We're in the time between Christmas and Lent it's winter time, a time of cold, snow, and darkness. We long for the sun's warm light. In this challenging time, we long for Christ's warming rays. Where can we find the warmth of God, God's love, to melt the chill that our souls are feeling? So over the next five weeks, we'll be looking at five different approaches to nurturing the path of light. So this week, we'll be going to using a prayer approach called Visio Divina and look at uh, the storm at sea uh, that uh, Rembrandt painted. Next week, we're going to look at creation, nurturing hope among nature, to the restorative power of God's creation. Then through the very acts of creativity, finding hope through that, through the different uh, creative aspects of our, uh, of our lives. The fourth week, we'll look at beauty, where we open our senses to God's language. And we conclude on the sixth of 
February, uh, where we look at justice. And by doing these acts of justice, they are uh, very constructive ways of dealing with despair and leading us more towards hope. So tonight we'll turn our eyes to Christ. He's the master teacher and the light of the world. His instruction is the key to all the other paths. We'll focus on the one passage and representation in sacred art. And we'll be looking at the storm in the Sea of Galilee found in Mark's gospel and depicted by Rembrandt. We'll use a prayer form called Visio Divina or seeing God's light to explore the meaning of this passage. Visio Divina is not only a beautiful prayer form, but also a way of healing, a spirituality, if you want. A way to draw closer to God. And we'll be exploring some of the possibilities of Visio Divina for our present, situa our present situation. So what is this Visio Divina of which I speak? Well, there it has parallels with Lectio Divina, but it isn't the, quite the same. And on, uh, on the left-hand side, you see the, the, the four steps of Lectio Divina, which will be familiar to you, particularly if you follow uh, uh, Cardinal Collins' uh, series on, on Lectio Divina. Um, but you'll see there's a slightly different order with Visio Divina. You start off with seeing, you meditate on what you have seen, and then there is a movement of Lectio where in when we're dealing with sacred art, we go to the scriptural passage. And we could also provide some context. And tonight, when we're looking at the uh, storm at sea, I'll be leading you through a meditation, which will also be part of this Lectio. Oratio is praying. We pray about what's going on. And then complatio, uh, contemplatio, where we ponder, what does this mean? What, where is God being present in this whole process? And then we're going to look at this uh, final part called operatio or act. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later. So the first part, Visio. This is Rembrandt's painting of the storm of the Sea of Galilee, which he painted in 1633. As we look at this image, ask God to guide you, guide your impressions and thoughts as you look at the painting. This painting of Jesus and his disciples in their boat in the stormy sea is dark and shrouded in shadows, but there is a ray of light streaming down to help us see what's going on in the boat. Can you all see the image clearly? Good, good, good. What do you notice? What part of the painting draws your attention? We go to the second part, meditatio, or to meditate. And we look within at the feelings that this painting evokes. Consider the whole canvas and the individual parts.
Now let's look at the passage. I'll read it out loud. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you, no, have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. So for the second part of the, um, of the uh, Lectio, we're going to uh, go through the different characters. An interesting thing about this painting is that in addition to the 12 disciple who accompanied Jesus in the boat, there's a 13th person present. And who is that? Rembrandt often painted himself into the paintings. This, I guess, is his version of a selfie. He's setting an example for us to find ourselves in the gospel. Bringing God to our stress and our sin, our hurts and our hopes. He is in the boat with the disciples. Rembrandt paints himself as a man in the blue shirt on the left-hand side of the boat near the back. He's standing and holding on to the guy wire. His other hand is on his forehead as he stares blankly out to the dark sea. Maybe he's flooded with emotion and shut down. It almost seems he's looking to us. He's physically close to Jesus, but he's not looking at him, just like Rembrandt. We put ourselves in the boat. In Rembrandt's painting, each of the people with Jesus in the boat has their own reaction to the storm. It's something like the different roles that people play in a family or a church. We go through the crew members, the disciples take note of the person. As we go through the crew members, the disciples, Take note of the person you most identify with today. In different situations or at different times in your life, you might find that you have different reactions. On top, the man in the bow of the ship is on top riding the huge wave. He's a leader and a professional fisherman who's focused on his work, earnestly trimming the front sail. Perhaps it's an adventure for him, and maybe it's just working hard at his job. Three of the men, probably experienced fishermen, are on the mast working frantically to fix the uh, main sail. The gale winds have ripped it and snapped the metal wire so that the boom is disconnected from the mast. In a sense, it's like the frontline workers that we have in our uh, in the pandemic working frantically to keep things going.
there's a huge wave that's pounding the, the man in yellow on the left of the middle. And he's hanging on to a guy wire for dear life. Some of us are just barely hanging on, some of our colleagues. Many of the crew seem afraid, but especially the man in the right side of the boat, who's crouched over and looking with dread at the enormous wave that's swamping the boat. You can almost feel him trembling with anxiety. On the lower left back is a distressed man with his hand on his forehead and leaning over the side of the boat. It seems he's about ready to throw up. And some of us are just sick with anxiety about the present situation. There are two disciples that appear angry at Jesus. One shakes him awake and the other raises his voice. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So behind the man who is retching, we see a kneeling disciple who's looking at Jesus with trust and reverence. Perhaps it's St. John. Rem uh, Rembrandt has painted a tiny little halo on this disciple's head. Hard to see, but it's there. And it's there to signify his faith in Jesus in the midst of this terrible storm. On the lower left of the boat is the man in white that's easy to miss. His back is faced to us. He's sitting still and alone, and he seems to be separated from the frightening storm and the chaos going on around the boat. He's tuned out. He's separate. He's alone. And sometimes that's us, that we need our alone time, our quiet time, our downtime to gather ourselves. And then there's this man in the rear at the helm. In the stern of the very back, this disciple holds a tiller. He must be another experienced fisher, the fisherman, because he's in charge of the boat. Perhaps this is Peter. He's certainly a leader. He's responsible for guiding the boat's course and instructing the crew. This is my hero, actually, in this in this painting. This is who I want to be. I want to be active. I want to be doing something. I want to lead. I want to do use whatever gifts I have. But at the same time, keep my eyes on Christ, to look at Christ and let Christ be my guide during this difficult time. That's what I aspire to be. Look closely at Jesus. Cold rain is pelting down on him. Waves are swamping the boat. Winds are whipping and tossing the boat around violently, yet Jesus is sleeping. Surely he is not unaware of the dangerous storm, nor is he faking sleep. He must be napping. Certainly he is at peace. How could Jesus be so relaxed when he and his disciples were in such great danger? 
Was he planning all along to calm the storm? Jesus wasn't just in the boat. He was in Abba's arms. He wasn't just in the storm. He was in the kingdom of God. He was at peace in the storm because he trusted his Abba to take care of him. No matter what happened. This is the hidden miracle in this gospel story and why after Jesus calmed the storm, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? That's a ridiculously funny question in a sense. The disciples must have looked at each other incredulously. You've got to be kidding me. Let's see. Why are we afraid? Well, there's this huge wave, we're nearly drowning, and the boat is in danger of being capsized. And then it was realizing that we were sitting next to the Son of God with power over nature. Jesus was being sincere. If they learned to live with him and our loving creator, then they wouldn't be afraid, even in a terrible storm, Jesus was so relaxed that God's peace permeated his body. It was this peace in his body that spoke during the storm. In Rembrandt's painting, it seems that Jesus is looking to the opening in the heaven and the light that is breaking through. Most everyone else in the boat is either looking at the storm or what they're trying to do to secure themselves. Jesus is the only person in the boat who sees the source of light in the heavens. Notice that the light of God is not just coming from the heavens. It's also glowing from Jesus' body. Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. He is the light of the world and the Prince of Peace. The disciple kneeling at Jesus' feet sees Jesus' light. Perhaps the disciple that also is drawn to that light. Here's the core of the story. Jesus finds light in the darkness. Jesus is the light in the darkness. We turn to Jesus who is the light and divine seeing, visio divina. This brings God's presence despite the storm. And we return to the full image and there's a, a point there that perhaps isn't immediately clear, it wasn't immediately clear to me until somebody pointed out that there's a cross and the mast forms a vertical beam of the cross. It's right there in the middle of the painting. Last uh, March, Pope Francis addressed uh, the world and he used this gospel passage and he talked about the cross at that point. And this is what Pope Francis said. Embracing his cross means finding courage to embrace all the hardships of the present time, abandoning for a moment our eagerness for power and possessions in order to make room for the creativity that only the spirit is capable of inspiring. It means finding the courage to create spaces where everyone can recognize that they are called and to allow new forms of hospitality, fraternity, and solidarity. By his cross, we've been saved in order to embrace hope and let it strengthen and sustain all measures and all possible avenues for helping us protect ourselves and others. Embracing the Lord in order to embrace hope, that is the strength of faith, which frees us from fear and gives us hope. The fourth movement is a ratio or prayer. And the underlying question is, where is the sacred present in this experience? We bring our own storm into this gospel story. Some storms like that we experience, like this one in the Sea of Galilee are dangerous. 
There are storms of stress or not knowing what to do. The fear of having loved ones in dangerous situations. And then there are the other storms that I was mentioning before, the racial injustices, the plagues, political turbulences, economic challenges, concerns about climate change. How are you dealing with your personal storms? Let's just take a couple of minutes to bring God into our prayer, into our study, and look at uh, our own storms and how God, how we're bringing God into that storm. Let's go to the fifth movement, which is called Contemplatio, where we ponder. We've come out of prayer, if we ever do really come out of prayer, to consider this experience we've gone through where we've been exploring how God has been present in this scene, in the action of the scene, in our relationship with the uh, different characters on that boat. And um, let's just think a bit about that. It, there's different levels in which that storm operates. It could be the anger which occasionally uh, interrupts the flow of my life. It's also a sense of discomfort as well. And um, this is a bit of a personal storm that I have um, about this painting. And it's such a male dominated scene. There's um, 14 men in a boat, Jesus, Rembrandt and 12 disciples. Yeah. Like a great deal of uh, sacred art, it, was painted by a man. And um, now it's being interpreted by another male. And so this painting produces a challenge. And we live in stormy times when we question exclusively male and patriarchal perspectives. Where do we find light in this situation? I think paradoxically, God is found in my discomfort. God is provoking me to reach beyond this overly male perspective on things to a new way of uh, looking at the world. And that's part of the journey that I am on. And lastly is operatio or to act. And I'm borrowing here from Archbishop Sylvain Levois from Western Canada. And he uses this process uh, a lot in his retreats. In fact, he also adds music into it as well. 
Um, so he calls that audio divina. So he has visio divina, lectio divina, audio divina. And he also uses it in his personal life. He says he goes through this process when he's um, creating his, uh, his homilies and his presentations. Um, so uh, uh, he, um, it, what it really refers to is what do you do because of this? How do we complete our prayer? How do we make it go out into the streets? What difference is it going to make in, in our lives? How do I resolve to look for the light of Christ in one another? So at this point, I normally tell you about where you can find the painting, but I can't. It got stolen. 1990, thieves broke into the Isabel Gardner Museum in Boston and uh, took the canvas and it hasn't been found since. Um, so sadly, we can't go there. All you can see is that empty frame when you go into the gallery uh, in, in Boston. Okay. Um, we're going to go to a wider view of Visio Divina now. And in this wider view of Visio Divina, there's I'm going to look at it not just as one part of a spiritual practice, but something that can be made larger into um, perhaps a spiritual discipline and a way of healing, a way of looking at God's light and how it can shine through us and sh we can recognize it shining through the world. Now, if at any times you have, uh, you have questions, uh, uh, just put them up there and I'll uh, uh, try and answer them at the end, okay? It isn't always obvious. It isn't always obvious what we're looking at. This picture I took in York Minster in, uh, in England about three years ago. And it is looking up. It's looking up at the, the crossing. It's the central part of the cathedral. And we don't know what is there, what is rending the, uh, that ceiling in two. Is it a massive architectural fault? No. What it is, is it, it's a view of the cross from below with a shroud hanging from it, draping from it. I think it's a beautiful image to, to, to think about uh, what we're doing is we're looking at things from a little bit of a different angle here, to looking at how we can uh, bring sacraments away from just being this, these seven sacraments, which uh, are, are so important in our lives, to a wider notion of sacramentality. Sacraments are those, those key moments in, uh, in our lives, which draws particularly close to God. There are moments of deep grace, but they aren't the only moments of grace in our lives. And sacramentality is where we look for those other moments of grace through our whole existence. Martin Buber wrote that everything is full of sacramental substance, everything. Everything and each function is ever ready to light up into a sacrament. And Hopkins, the, the George Manny Hopkins wrote that the world is charged with God's grandeur. So we're going to look at six different ways of being able to see that sacramentality using divine seeing or visio divina to see how those moments of God's grace, sometimes they're called thin moments, the Celtic people call them thin moments where the distance between us and God is very thin. And the, um, there are six things that we're going to be looking at. 
We've already looked at one example of that with the Visio Divina of, of sacred art. There are others as well that I use uh, extensively. This is one of my favorite. Uh, this is Caravaggio's uh, Calling of St. Matthew. It's in the Chiesa di San Luigi di Francese in, in Rome, near the Piazza Navona. It's a powerful piece and I'm suggesting some of these as more suggestions on, on the website. We're not gonna get into them tonight. I'm just showing you some of the possibilities of some of the pieces. Uh, and many of these pieces have a fair amount written about them. So you can also go into um, not only the, the scriptural passage, but some of the uh, other contextual information that can enrich this. Um, there's a great Khan Academy video on this particular piece. Henry Now and Father Henry Now, and um, who lived in the Larsh community, um, that's uh, partnered with uh, Our Lady Queen of the World. Um, he wrote a book on this they're called The Return of the Prodigal Son. The actual ca canvas is huge. It's uh, over two meters tall. It's found in the, the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg in, in Russia. And such a powerful depiction of that parable and you can go on and on and on. I used to uh, run full day retreats with York University uh, teacher candidates on, on this and uh, it never got old. One of the more famous uh, pieces that's associated with um, sacred art is this icon by Andrea Rublev of the Holy Trinity. Um, those who are in uh, the course of the Archdiocese, we're gonna come back to this next week, um, but the week after next. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very powerful piece. When we look at an icon, they say, we don't look at it, we read the icon. And the icon writers write the icon. It, it's uh, an interesting uh, way of looking at uh, the sacred art. And it was very important uh, to Orthodox worship. And we're just learning in the West, in Western Christianity, some of the depths of how powerful meditating on icons and sacred art can be. And then there's modern art. This is Kelly Lattimore's Holy Family. Um, Pope Francis uh, used this, this piece actually for one of the covers of his, um, uh, his books. Um, and Kelly Lattimore is a, is a young, relatively young iconographer. Now we can look at our churches as well as uh, places to look. When we pray, we don't just pray with words or thoughts. We pray with our eyes and think about our church, Our Lady Queen of the World. This is taken a number of years ago. And I know this is kind of poignant since we're in a bit of a state of exile from it. And you know this scene so well. You know exactly where you are looking up the aisle. And we're experiencing God's language of beauty in the statues, in the altar. The white robes tell us that it's Easter. And the, the, the triangular architecture of the church refers to the Trinity. There's triangles and sets of threes all over the place. If you start to look for them, they are there. And it, I think the, 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 um, many of us in the, in the pews don't often see it, but there's a beautiful stained glass window above the choir loft. And it has the, the, uh, the Trinity, the images of the Trinity in that. But there's a, there's a piece here that I didn't see straight away when I started coming to the parish. And that is the um, right Behind the altar, below the cross, there's this low wall that's in a particular shape. On one, my first thought was it's, it's a kind of an M, 
for Mary. And that makes sense. And maybe it is. But then it hit me one day that that wasn't what it really was, what it is most powerfully. It's the descending Holy Spirit. And you can see the beak just above Father's head, which is really appropriate. The light streaming from it in this, in, this, uh, in this picture, which was taken on a morning in May. So God's language is all around uh, us within the church. There's also the stained glass windows, the stations of the cross, and there's the other, other architectural uh, features that we find. Oh, you could also apply Visio Divina to secular art as well. This, this poster um, was in a workspace. It was actually in a, in, in, a, in a bit of a kitchen galley that we had when I worked at York Catholic. It was a poster that was there. And I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it uh, every once in a while. And it, I was trying to find the sacred meaning and, and then bang, it hit me one day. What is going on here is a sacred encounter. What's happening, this is uh, Paul Renoir, Renoir, and Renoir just loved to paint beauty. Beautiful as it is, there's another layer to it that I saw. And what was happening was that the uh, gentleman with the beard behind was, was pushing the man forward to meet the woman who was leaving the conservatory with the uh, manuscript rolled up and accompanied by the, uh, the woman behind her looking more right at her. And it's an introduction. And that I saw was part of my role as a catechist. I am a matchmaker, like those two in the background. And my role as a catechist was to introduce or revision ways in which people could see one another. It's a, it's a love relationship between God and God's people. And that was part of my role. And that's how this spoke to me. Not a cross in the place. Um, there's nothing overtly religious about what is going on but it can have a deep religious meaning if we use our religious imaginations and our uh, divine vision to see what's going on. It's interesting to note that in the uh, actual place where it's found in the Barnes collection in Philadelphia, how it is placed. So I was doing it in my own little context there, but the, uh, the curators at the museum were doing almost exactly the same thing. They were surrounding that very secular painting of all this religious imagery, all these other pieces of medieval art. And that's what we can do with a number of, uh, of secular pieces, not all secular art, but a lot of secular art. If we look at it, we can find things in it. We can see the sacred vision that's present. And then there's the Visio Divina of, of creation. Pope Francis has spoken extensively in Laudato Si and other places about the need to store our relationship with creation, to see the creator in creation. And these photos are ways that I've tried to find traces of God in nature. In fact, this place is called Holy Island. It's uh, also known as Lindisfarne, where St. Cuthbert was abbot. And so what I've, what I, 
what happened with uh, with this Visio Divina of creation was I put together a book and basic question that was driving me was where's God present in the Canadian landscape? And so I produced photos and prayers and reflections that, that portray this. And uh, I'll um, be spending a lot more time on this next uh, Sunday night. But to say, this is a product of Visio Divina, Visio Divina of God's creation. You, this uh, visual media, Visio Divina of, of visual media, uh, it could be movies, it could be TV, it could be uh, children's literature, which is another of my favorite uh, uh, things to, uh, to explore, particularly the, uh, the picture books uh, that, that are present. And then there's the Visio Divina of everyday life. Visio Divina sees the world through divine eyes. And what is this divine light that we need to see in these dark times? Visio Divina finds God's presence in all that we see in beauty and in pain, in the glorious and in the mundane. Visio Divina is charged with the creative curiosity to find God all around us. Our homes become domestic monasteries. Our fitness walks become pilgrimages. Visio Divina accompanies gratitude. Picture those in your life right now for whom you are particularly grateful. We are stretched in this storm, but we are grateful, not only for the frontline workers, but our caring families, for God's abiding presence, we're particularly grateful here for the ministry of Father Jojo and Father Michelle before him for accompanying us. And also with the parish pastoral team. Visio Divina moves us towards peace. Jesus knew how to find peace in the storm. He was peace in the storm. Contemplate those images of peace around us. Think about them. Young child sleeping. Snow softly falling. An icon of our Blessed Mother. These are the images in our daily lives that reflect the Christ light coming from that storm tossed boat. Visio Divina invites us to see the world with kind eyes, with compassionate eyes. So may God bless our time together. May it bring comfort and healing, light and peace, wonder and companionship. And thank you for accompanying me this evening. <laughs>